Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, and we have on with us today Dave Hodges from the Common Sense Show. And uh, I asked Dave to come on because I wanted to talk about uh, Lahaima, Maui, the wildfires that went on there. There has been so much information that's come out about this. And Dave, in my opinion, is probably the leading authority on the subject. So I didn't want to tackle it without somebody that really knows what they're talking about. So Dave, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts uh, with us about this whole incident that's taking place over in uh, Maui. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Stephen. Um, yeah, it's a tragedy and a monumental cover-up at the same time. And I'm disappointed in America that we're not doing more to help these people. We're not raising outrage. And and I think really, it, it, you know, to show you how far wide-ranging this plot is, ha has anyone heard anything from Congress on this? I mean, we, we send $24 billion to Ukraine. We spend six, $6 billion to uh, the uh, terrorist nation of Iran. And we send $700 per family to Lahaina. And uh, Tulsi Gabbard said it would take $5 billion. She was on Joe Rogan's show, and she said uh, it would take $5 billion to rebuild Lahaina to its original state. Uh, and, P and BJ Penn, the world-renowned uh, retired MMA fighter, Hall of Fame guy, very popular in the islands. He agreed with her. They were on the same show. And I have to tell you, um, no one in Congress has raised a word about the people in Maui. No one. The fix is in. The fix is in because the right people want that. And I'll, I'll start off with a big and then we can kind of retreat to the beginning. I'm convinced this is a Black Rock operation. This is my opinion. Uh, could I go into court and win? I don't know. But I sure as hell have enough circumstantial evidence to warrant a grand jury investigation. You know, it seems to me, Dave, that's really what it's going to take. And whether or not uh, anybody will actually do it is, is another question. And because the more of the evidence that I've seen that has come out about it, it's just too mysterious. I mean, there's too many... Uh, question marks that have happened uh, from, you know, not turning on the sirens, cutting off the water mm -hmm, supply, mm -hmm. uh, the death toll, they give you one number of death toll when clearly it's another. Uh, you know, listen, I really just, uh, I'd like for you just to dive into this. Okay. What got you involved in it, Dave? What what brought you into the circle of this? And uh, and take us down this, this very unique path uh, circumstances because you're directly involved it's not like you're uh you were just sitting on the sidelines looking at videos online you got directly involved with this whole scenario and so if you can share with us how you got involved and and what you have discovered as a result well uh let me address one thing you said and then i'll talk about the beginning you mentioned the differential numbers and the body counts there's two outstanding situations there one is that the police chief is also the coroner and under Hawaii state law, that's illegal and that still hasn't been rectified. And that's because he was the critical incident commander in my belief, well, not my belief, he was the critical incident commander in Vegas when they had the uh, mass shooting of 58 people in an outdoor concert. Eyewitnesses had shooters on the ground. This guy was doing a decent job investigating until, and I'm talking uh, Peltier about John Peltier, until the FBI showed up and whitewashed the investigation in Vegas. And that's because the principal target of the investigation was ex-CIA. And uh, we were able to determine that in our investigation. And there were multiple shooters involved as eyewitnesses. People came on my show and said, Dave, I was there. We saw muzzle flashes on the ground. Um, so that's one. Peltier has a history. And also, he's the coroner, as I just said. That's illegal. He can fudge the numbers. There's your answer right there on the numbers. And they're missing 2,000 plus kids. I have it at 2,400 when I use Department of Education statistics from the Hawaii State Government Department of Education. It's their numbers I'm using against them. And Stephen, let me just start there and then I'll back up right to the beginning about what got me interested because I'm on the topic. Um, when I was a young high school teacher, getting more experience at the time, I had some administrative duties. I was also a teacher and a coach. And I was on committees like how we do bus evacuation drills and DHS FEMA guidelines, how we do lockdowns at the schools. 
I know the procedures inside out, right side up. I know the legal ramifications as they existed then. And I can't imagine they change very much, but I guarantee one thing has not changed. In all of education, uh, even if it's not an emergency, kids must be supervised 100% of the time with direct line of sight. And there's no exceptions to that whatsoever. If you're a teacher in charge of kids and you don't have line of sight, you're accountable. You could be criminally accountable. And when they, and the, and I'll say this, the state government of Hawaii lied about the start dates after this event unfolded. They said they sent the kids home. And usually in a crisis, the truest stories you're going to get before they get censored and filtered uh, are in the immediate hours following the event. And what they said is they sent the kids home. And then they said, oh, no, school wasn't supposed to start until the day after the fire. Well, that was true for one of the three schools, but not the other two. One school started on the day before. One school started on the morning of the event. And these kids from those two schools were sent home. And I submit to you, uh, it's my strong belief, and I think it's bolstered by the numbers, that these, this forms the bulk of the missing kids. But look say this about line of sight supervision. There's no principle in America, not one principle would ever release kids to go home with a, a brewing crisis coming their way. Nobody would ever do that. This is so out of the line uh, of uh, protocols that you follow. Uh, the only way that a principal would have done that, because he'd be not only civilly liable, but he'd be criminally liable. And you could get into things like, you know, criminally negligent homicide. I mean, this is how serious this can be for a principal. So, and the superintendent too, who probably made the decision at the top level. But for these administrators, they did not send those kids home, Stephen. They were ordered to send those kids home. That's the only thing that makes any sense here because I know how the system works. And I'm thinking, well, who could have given that order? Well, the feds weren't on the ground. They weren't doing anything at that time. This is strictly either the emergency management director, Adaya, who's resigned, or it was the governor. Those are the only two as a principle that I'd listen to. And I'll tell you what I would have said, Stephen. Excuse me, governor, I understand what you're telling me, but this violates the protocols of lockdown procedures or bus evacuation procedures. I am not doing that. I'm following my protocols. And if you want this done, you need to come here and give the order in person. That's exactly what I would have said to him as an administrator. And I've talked to some of my past administrators I worked with, and they've all said the same thing. There, there's no deviation here. The, the procedures are so critical and so important that no one in their right mind would deviate from this. And, and, let's and just, so let's clarify real quick, Dave, just for the listeners that may not understand why the seriousness of this. And that is because you've got a wildfire rushing through this territory out there you send these kids home they're they're minors they're unsupervised they're going home uh into a a, in like a war zone almost and And presumably the parents would have been at work so you're releasing them to a non-supervised situation and here's the other thing we know that that school district has 15 long buses hold 72 kids each and then they have mini buses we have a photo aerial photo of the buses the day before the fire and they're nowhere to be seen after the fire. Okay. And there's a grainy video out there that uh, purports to show the buses on some undisclosed military base on Maui. I have to tell you, Stephen, I've seen the video and I wouldn't say, yeah, that's a school bus. I think it's possible, but it's too grainy and too distant. And I think it was too contrived. The guy walked right up to a military base and is filming in and he's not interfered with that never happens. I don't, I don't see how he would have got away with that especially if they had kids and those buses on that on that base, they'd have been hypersensitive to anyone coming to look. So I, I don't buy that for a second. I don't believe the story. Um, they still don't know where these kids are at. Well, someone knows. But here's the thing, Stephen. If they have school buses in this district, let's just make up a number. You would presume half the kids would be bused, okay, just for the sake of argument. Could have been a third, could be three-fourths. We don't know. But a significant number of kids would be bused if you had 15 school buses. Okay, did they bust them home? Where's the record? Why hasn't this been released? Where did they drop them off? Um, And I will tell you this, they can't just drop them off. You would have had to take them on a bus. And if you're going to release the kids, they had to be released to a civilian authority or to their parents. 
and their parents would have had to sign for them. I remember as a coach, if I went on a road trip with a basketball team and, and a parent wanted to take their child home for whatever reason, they had to sign the kid out right there on the spot. There's no, there's no option here. If you don't do that as a coach or administrator, you're fired and you're in big trouble. I mean, this is criminal. It's not just civil. So anyway, that's to answer your question. We have 2,400 missing kids and procedures were not followed that every school district in the country would have followed these procedures. No exception whatsoever. Okay. Now, having said that, how did I get involved in this? Well, I fought an eight-year battle against the John McCain mafia uh, with 300 of my neighbors, rural neighbors, because they were trying to long haul, get us off our property without compensation approach. Now they lied and said we were too close to Luke Air Force Base and said, that's why you should never been allowed to build there and you need to get the hell out. No eminent domain, no payment, just took away our property rights and hope we'd have a fire, couldn't get a permit to rebuild. And they were doing a long haul because they had a 25 year build out plan. So they didn't have to get us off right away, but they started on us to get a majority of us out before they'd have to do eminent domain. But anyway, long story short with this, we knew this was a bunch of nonsense because uh, first of all, we had letter from the base commander when we built, perfectly fine. Secondly, we're 30 air miles from the base. They have to fly over 300,000 people to even reach our property. So we knew this was a lie. And one night I was looking at a map from Maricopa County Association of Government, which are all the towns and cities in the county. And they had the Canamex Highway Project in four areas of the state, my area, South Tucson, Gila Bend, and the Yuma Farmers, east of Yuma. And they were going to put a Canamex Highway through. And they were using the same excuse with them as they did with us. And I'm thinking, okay, let me run some odds. I was teaching statistics at the time. So I put it into this program called SPSS with the variables. The odds of all this being due to chance were 65 million to one. So I knew they were lying. And so as I researched it further, I was right. They were trying to get Americans off their land for an international project from the Central American Free Trade Agreement passed by John uh, McCain and Ted Kennedy, the late Ted Kennedy and late John McCain. Um, we started an eight-year battle and uh, we saw every dirty trick in the book used against us from the media to the government. Now, eventually we got a bunch of state officials and legislators on our side. And I got to say that was due largely to my great state Senator, Jack Harper, who was forced out because he complained about voter fraud, incidentally. But uh, Jack was a stand-up man and uh, and came to our aid. And he got Russell Pierce and these other uh, really good administrators and also legislators to help us. And eventually we will win. We got a good law firm finally after being blocked for eight years. And uh, they backed down on the courthouse steps. So today we're pretty well unencumbered. Uh, so to say I'm hypersensitive to property rights issues is an understatement. This took eight years from my life. So when I looked at Maui, I first thought, oh my gosh, my wife and I, we've had such good times there, so many great memories. Uh, how horrible. You know, we used to play the Kanapali golf course and go to the beach. And uh, Stephen, it was just a fantastic place. And it was so calm and peaceful. It was like taking a sedative without the side effects. And I was heartbroken. I was just heartbroken for these people. Yes. But it was about the third day that I started to see the same crap that we experienced here in Arizona. And I said, something ain't right here. Something ain't right with this governor. And I started to see a, an, an emotional indifference towards the welfare of the people. Um, then we started to hear about Red Cross and FEMA intercepting food and critical medical supplies like heart medicine, cancer pills, uh, uh, insulin. These, these, uh, and I've heard too. They took the the materials and threw them into landfills. Uh, this is what I've been told by eyewitnesses. Threw them into landfills. So Stephen, then I knew something was horribly wrong. And then I went back and I saw that the day after the incident. Jeff Bezos wanted to swoop in with his $100 million money bag and buy Lahaina and build a smart city there. Now, the entire time in the week that followed the event, the government officials were saying that there's not going to be no smart island here. You guys are all wrong. But Steve and I proceeded to go to their websites. And that's all I found were sustainable development goals, Agenda 2030. The governor had been 
uh, to an Agenda 2030 conference at the UN. You can see all the placards in the background one month before the event. The day before the event, this is the sine qua non. This is what got my attention. I found out that this governor, Josh Gang Green, as I've uh, nicknamed him, because he's poison to the people and he's a gangster, um, he actually issued a, a proclamation. Lahaina is indeed a historical preserved site. But if there's a natural disaster, then the state will take the land over and rezone it. I mean, how stupid could that be to do that one day before the event? But that's what he did. That's what he did. And and now, um, Project you know what, Veritas. You know what, John, what, what gets me, that's exactly, we see these type scenarios play over and over again. Uh, e even the, the towers, I'll just call it that way there, uh, look at the, the changes that were done before they went down. Uh, the insurances and things like that, everything that was being done. I was quickly looking too, because when you mentioned John McCain, uh, the late Senator John McCain, of course, he was Senator of your, your state there in Arizona. And uh, with what he was involved with that you spent eight years battling. And then again, I'm thinking about Ukraine, uh, interesting, a whole country embroiled in war. Can't help but wonder uh, what all he had in mind there. But, you know, and, and not really taking the time to look at it, but there's a lot of articles about John McCain in Maui, Hawaii, et cetera. I wonder if there's a link in there somewhere. Don't know. I that haven't found that, that worth but, but I haven't into, looked. Though. I haven't looked. I've looked at the principles involved, you know. I'll worry about ancillaries because the ancillaries like a McCain uh, left organization could play into this. But right now I'm trying to be laser beamed and really focused on on the main things. Uh, but but well, I was well, I, since you hit the pun, let's go ahead and quickly address that. What is is there anything to the to the idea that that there were actually laser beams that started the fire? Yes. OK, but not the Chinese. I'll differentiate between the yes and not the Chinese. Um, I want, Eric, I want you to lead this, John. I'm sorry. I just wanted to throw <laughs> you threw it, and I'm like, well, we got a pun already to work with. So <laughs> no, no, I, I hear you. Laser focus was an unfortunate pun. I didn't mean to have it come out that way. Um, let's just say my focus is narrow. Now let's talk about the lasers. Okay. Um, there was there was a news story um, that ran, and it was on Channel Two out of Honolulu, so it's mainstream media. And in retrospect, the news story was the worst news story I think I've ever seen. They said lasers from the sky and they showed these green rays coming down. OK, uh, coming from the sky and it's from Chinese satellites. But don't worry, nothing will happen to you if you look at the laser. Nothing, no bad effects will happen. They say you're safe. Uh, the mystery continues. OK, first of all, in the report, they never referenced where they got their information. They didn't interview anybody. It was just reading from a script. And I'll tell you what this was. This is so poorly put together. This was a cover story. This is like our Air Force base story where we knew it wasn't right. about the base. It was about the Canamex Highway. Um, we know that this was a cover story. Okay. It was so poorly constructed. And let me tell you how I know. All right. The death count was driven up by blocking the exits, even though three hours before the Lahaina school were used to evacuate the tourists. And I've got that on video. Okay, Three hours later, they're blocking the exits for people to leave. Okay, The Chinese didn't do that. The, the water was not transferred from one source to another so they could fight the fire. The Chinese didn't have the ability to do that. And they didn't sound the sirens. And by the way, the explanation the governor and the, then the emergency director said, oh, the people would have thought it was a tsunami and run upwards and got burned up. And I'm thinking that's got to be the most stupid thing I ever heard. But here's the deal. When you go to the Hawaii state government website, at least it was true a month ago, um, they said use of sirens. And they listed a whole smorgasbord of things, including fire. It should have been sounded. Now, the Chinese didn't have the ability to manipulate that. OK. Also, there were no defense installations attacked. And, and why would the Chinese just burn out Lahaina? OK but not attack any defense installations. I mean, from a military standpoint, that makes absolutely no sense. Okay, and then you have the collusion of the governor. 
uh, when the governor came into office, uh, they did an overlay real estate agreement from a land management group inside the Hawaiian government for the city of Lahaina. And what they did was they had uh, parceled 51 acre home sites for $750 million. But wait a minute, that land is privately owned at that time. So this was an overlay designation. It's like, we're going to do this now and wait for the destruction to take place. I mean, how stupid could you be? But nonetheless, it's from the state government of Hawaii that they did this land deal. Then you have the governor's uh, proclamation saying, you're a historical preserve, preserve site unless you have a natural disaster. And then you have the Chinese cover story where there's no logistics whatsoever that would pull China into this to have a legitimate motive for doing this. So they're building the damn narrative. But the thing where they really screwed up, I think, was where Jeff Bezos shot his big mouth off. I bet they are really sorry about this. Uh, we're not doing a smart city here. Oh, no, 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 no. Deny, deny, deny. But Jeff Bezos the day after said that. And Stephen, it's on their documents. And next Monday, they have a meeting with all the government principals in Hawaii, land, the governor, uh, this board of uh, Build Beyond Barriers, Build Back Better, sounds a lot like that. They're all meeting, and they don't say smart cities, 15-minute cities, but they do say sustainable development goals. They talk about all the renewable projects, bike paths, mass transit, no cars. And I'm saying, gee, that that's 15 minute cities there. that's that's sustainable development for smart cities you don't have to call it an elephant to see an elephant and, and that's exactly what we're seeing here and they say at the top of the document that i read from on youtube it says do not believe social media that this was done to basically take over the land and turn it into a smart island no it is exactly what it is in fact i've got an overlay plan from the state of hawaii that shows how maui was going to be carved up into smart city organization. Everything from transportation to bike paths, it's a visual map. And I covered it on YouTube. I showed it as an add-on. So like I said, Stephen, this was the worst contrived plot and cover-up I've ever seen. Do you remember in the old days, we had to work to find stories like this. This stuff just landed in my lap. I don't deserve any credit for this. I could have done this research when I was in the ninth grade. Do you know, Dave, that... Uh... A lot of people may not know, but even Ukraine is earmarked to become uh, the EU's first. And they're not, of course, they're not a European Union member as of yet, but they're going to be the first smart country. It is yes. supposed to be rebuilt as the most highly advanced technical city in the world or country in the world. I didn't know well, if you were aware of this that. This is a very good lead-in to BlackRock in getting into who benefited. I'm doing a presentation later today called The Battle of Lahaina, Who Won? And um, in that, Stephen, what, what I'm, I'm showing is that, first of all, it's interesting you mentioned Ukraine. BlackRock volunteered to lead the rebuilding effort in Ukraine. Oh, we'll do it for no cost. Oh, hold on, hold on. Your subsidiaries are going to be the contractors so, and your major investors in these companies. So don't tell me you're not going to benefit. And so it's it's they're trying to make it look like they're humanitarian. They're not. This is for profit. But it's also for what you're saying. It's for a smart country. And this is exactly what they're going to do. You're exactly right. Now let's go to Maui. The biggest developer that stands to get the best windfall from vacated Lahaina properties will be Keller Williams. They're the number one developer in the United States. Uh, their major stockholder, you guessed it, 19.5% holdings, BlackRock. They're number one. It's interesting, Vanguard is number two at 14%. Okay, now, here's what's really interesting. BlackRock is controlling all the variables. Um, on one hand, they control the major developer, and on the other hand, are the major investor and stockholder for Hawaii Electric. Hawaii Electric is being sued by the county of Maui. Now, stay, stay with me on this, folks, because I'm going to have to go through this logically. It's like working an algebra problem. Right. But, but once, once, if you understand what I'm telling you, then you'll see how BlackRock is in position to manipulate all of this. Now, the lawsuit from uh, the county of Maui against 
Hawaii Electric says that your failure to provide a safe set of lines and to not have underbrush that spread the fire and all these things, you're at fault. You're the major reason this fire got out of control. And then Hawaii Electric, interestingly enough, they're saying, oh, contraire, mon frere, that's not true. We turned that power off and we can prove it six hours before the fire reached Lahaina. So this is not true. And by the way, the reason that the police chief gave for closing the Maui, the Lahaina, Lahaina exits, they wouldn't let the people escape and they, most of them got burned up, was because of down power lines. Well, if they turned off the power, there was nothing in the live power lines that should have necessitated a, a blocking of the exits. But it gets better. The major investor in Hawaii Electric at 8.5% of their stock is BlackRock. And you're saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. The biggest developer, okay, go, going into Lahaina will probably be Keller Williams. And then you're saying, gee, but they're going to be on the losing side with BlackRock when they get sued. Let me tell you what I learned from my experience, okay, in dealing with with uh, our property rights issue for eight years in the McCain mafia. I can tell you this is exactly what they're going to try to do. They've got this lawsuit and they know civilian lawsuits are coming behind it. Okay. So you have the Ma Maui County lawsuit. Now you have individual lawsuits, probably for negligence. Uh, they're hoping, I'm sure that they'll get criminal negligence investigation from a grand jury, but don't hold your breath. But what they're going to end up betting on is to find a corrupt judge that's under the control of BlackRock. He'll enjoin all the lawsuits together. Now, stay with me on this. So you have the individuals and you have the county. The judge will say, well, this is a class action. We're going to put them all together. This happens all the times in property rights lawsuits, all the time. How do I know? Because I spent eight years researching case law. So this is something I know really well. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the individual lawsuits, put them with the Maui County lawsuit, which is a weak case at best. Because if they can prove that those power lines were not active at the time of the fire, there's very little case. So they'll do an out-of-court settlement. There'll be non-disclosure agreements. And these people who are the citizens, the surviving victims of Lahaina, will not be able to talk about this because they'll be forever silenced. And they'll get pennies on the dollar. They'll be out of their property. And developers like Ke uh, Keller Williams will come in and take over. Now, what I've advised the Hawaiian elders to do, and I did this in writing this morning, I said, when it comes time to file the lawsuits, you need to find some issues that are violations of state statute and violations of federal law. And because you have indigenous population there, you probably have civil rights legislation that'll get you into federal court. And I said, if you separate your lawsuits this way, then a judge is not going to be able to enjoin all the lawsuits because one's federal and one state. And those are apples and oranges as far as the judge's purview. Is he the state judge or the federal judge? A judge cannot be of both. So there'll be a second federal judge, and he can't enjoin a federal lawsuit with a state lawsuit, even if he wanted to. So now they got the problem of two investigations, two discoveries, and how much can they cover up? This doubles the chances of the indigenous elders in Hawaii of getting to the bottom of what really happened there. So this is what I've advised them to do based on my experience with this property right stuff. And no, Stephen, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll tell you this. I In 2012, the last year we were fighting this property rights battle, I could have matched wits with any property lawyer in the country because I had eight years of concentrated study. And well, I'm not a fool. I've got I've got two advanced degrees. I'm not stupid. I know how to do research. Uh, One thing's so, for sure, they won't have a problem finding the corrupt judge because, as you know, and uh, as you've probably already experienced with the McCain Mafia, uh, these politicians, they're only part of the corruption that's already ongoing. Uh, so, yeah, they're definitely, they, 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 they had their crooked judge before they got started. You know, the weird thing is uh, uh, that I'm seeing, Dave, is that they're making all these stupid mistakes, like the case where you know they, they do this filing the day or their, or their announcements the day before uh, the fires come and things like that. You know, and it's making it easier for the everyday uh, citizen to recognize something is really up. And just like you mentioned, 
these properties will sell for pennies on the dollar in this this lawsuit that will end up being filed as a class action lawsuit. And uh, and then once that's settled, that all that they immediately have surrendered their property rights because they accept a settlement. Exactly right. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a mess. Well, it's, it's you, you bring up a really good point there. And I, I got to tell you one thing right now, just from uh, the discussions I've had, email and in-person Zoom calls, um, the Hawaiian elders have some research to do on this. And they're going to have a hard time finding lawyers on, in the Hawaiian islands because we had four lawyers cancel on us on our deal because here's what we got told repeatedly. Our partners, we'd like to take your case, but our partners want to be judges. And if McCain becomes president, well, you know how that goes. So they're going to run into similar political pressures with law firms. What they have to find yeah. is like a lawyer out of San Diego who's also exactly. licensed in Hawaii and has a conscience. He's 70 years old, close enough to retirement. He doesn't give a crap about the ramifications. And then they go in and do this. Okay. And I've seen this enough times. I've helped when, when I, when we ended up winning and getting our property rights, I got requests from all over the country to be a consultant to some of these people. And, and so I've seen a variety of situations and that's how I know that pretty much how this is going to go down. By the way, James O'Keefe, who I have, have really good respect for as a, as a investigative journalist, um, he didn't stay in Maui long enough to really break the stuff that I did. And I'm not bragging, not saying I'm better than James, but I'm just saying everything he said, been there, done that, except one thing. He validated a Tulsi Gabbard statement that was made on Joe Rogan's show. And he showed the clip yesterday. And James, hats off to you, my friend. I could match you in a hundred other stories, but on this one story, you know, I've I've had a month to go deeper. But I'm just going to say this. He played a clip of the governor. And this is priceless. And this is probably better than anything I have. The governor said, yeah, we're going to have to, uh, the state's going to have to take control of Lahaina. We'll build a memorial. Now, Tulsi Gabbard goes a step further. She mm -hmm. said, not only are they going to build that memorial, they're going to ship the survivors off to the big island and the land's going to be rezoned and so forth um, under smart city provisions. But, uh, hey, James, tip of the cap to you, my friend. You do the best work out there. Anyone I've seen, uh, his 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 exposure of the vaccine companies, unparalleled. Okay, But I'll say in this instance, the one contribution he made to something that I did not have was what Tulsi Gabbard claimed. And, she, and I thought Tulsi Gabbard was making a claim that she didn't have any backing for on Joe Rogan's show. And he provided that backing. So what I'm telling you is the fix is already in. The fix is in. And this governor is stupid because him saying this, that we're taking the land from these people, if you're on a jury and you see this tape and you know that there's been no attempt to make the Lahaina residents full, you know, and whole back on their land, then right away, my mind gets suspicious, suspicious if I'm on the jury. This he was he's so arrogant. He thinks that he could just say anything, anytime. And no one's going to question him. Uh, so, but there's there's even more to this issue here. Um, Stephen, it's my contention, and you asked me about the lasers, and I'll address that in a second. But it's my contention that there was deliberate intent to drive up the death uh, count. And it bothered me for two days. I came to the conclusion, when you block the exits, and you're the police, and you have to run for your lives, but you see people jumping out of their cars, jumping the seawall and jumping into the ocean. OK, should you get a clue? Maybe we should move our cars and let the people escape that can escape. But they didn't do that. They were under strict orders. Um, they wanted to drive up the death curve. Why wouldn't you play the sirens? Here's the explanation given at press conference number one by Herman Adaya, the guy who resigned because of health reasons. He said, well, we don't play the uh, sirens for fires. That's a lie. That's a violation of state law. He knows it. But the second thing he said was even comical. They might have had the music on in the house or the air conditioner because it's summer and they wouldn't have heard the sirens. So let's see. Let's not give them a chance. Let's just let them sit in their homes and get burned up. 
I mean, this is the bull crap that they were saying at this press conference. And, and Stephen, when I saw that first press conference, I said, I'm getting involved. Been there, done that. I see the BS. I've dealt with this kind of behavior before, and I'm going to get involved in this. And that one statement. And then the governor comes out two speakers later, and he says, yeah, when I was on the island, uh, I think it was Lanai, he said, yeah, we were told, yeah, uh, only play the sirens for a tsunami. Otherwise, you might run into the fire. And I'm thinking, how stupid do you think people are? They hear a siren, so they're going to run and jump in the fire. I mean, this is, I mean, I mean, this would be a bad Saturday Night Live script. Um, th- th- it's so ridiculous, but they're so arrogant, they don't care. They just don't care. Now, the lasers. Eric West from Hawaii Realty. He was on a road not far from the highway that you can't stop or take pictures of the green tarp fence being put around Lahaina. So, Stephen, here's what's really interesting about this. Eric stops. And he's got a guide with him, some expert on metallurgy or whatever he was. I'm not sure. Uh, They didn't expose that very well. But they showed these cars that were just incinerated, uh, metal melted. And it's interesting. Even the dang police chief said, we may never find all these bodies because it was so hot. It melted metal. Wait a minute. The temperature of the fire was standard. It was 1,472 degrees. To melt metal, we're now talking 2,200 to 2,550 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're almost 1,000 degrees hotter. Also, they found a burned out cell phone. I says, oh my gosh, where's the human? It was melted, but you could tell it it had been a cell phone. And then they had dog fur. Uh, Where's the dog's body? Melting. All these things melted. But here's what was interesting. There was a cul-de-sac of nice homes, okay? The cul-de-sac shape, the curve, was like a a figure eight curve on one side. Uh, It was approximately 50 to 70 feet from the two cars. And the burn marks went right along the cul-de-sac sidewalk, did not cross over. Never in the history of firefighting has there been such a fire. On the opposite end, there is a block fence Uh, backing up to a nice property and the burn goes right up to the fence and you see a few scorch marks on the fence and above them on hills are really nice homes. I mean, well in excess of a couple million dollars. So you see also indentation black marks around these cars. To me, Stephen, what this tells me, and I ran this by one of my military sources, I said, tell me I'm not seeing laser shots that missed and laser shots that hit with a defined burn pattern. He goes, that's exactly what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. The evidence, and and it it wasn't just this one location. Eric West also found another location on the same highway with a single car incident where this happened. And before they could get done with their analysis, uh, these unidentified police, presumably not from the islands, showed up and made them leave. The second time Eric got caught stopping, in fact, actually Eric got a ticket He went up to a, uh, it was right outside the the green fence they put up, the 10 foot fence. And he stopped and he says, why are we not allowed to stop here? By what provision of the constitution? And and they wrote him a ticket and he had to go to court. I don't know what happened in court. He he had a uh, expired uh, license plate. He could pay that fine by mail. This one required him to go in. And the governor's proclamation is what they cited eventually. And the governor's proclamation isn't even defined as far as penalties go. I saw an interview yesterday with a lawyer in Lahaina, and he's he's volunteered his his services, and he filed a lawsuit. He's filing a lawsuit today, and he said uh, that the 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 statute's unenforceable; it's not constitutional. He said it goes to thirty two other provisions, none of which provide for penalties. So they have a meaningless proclamation, but they're using it to still illegally write people up. Let me give you one other thing they did, Stephen. This is amazing. This happened in Paradise, California as well. And my friend Paul Preston saw it. What they did, and this was covered on Hawaii News Now, mainstream media, they scrubbed the story. Fortunately, this guy has a channel, excuse the expression, it's called Hustle Bitch, as in female dog. Uh, that's the name of his channel. I'm not trying to be graphic here. That's okay. Um, but he does good work. I, I'm impressed with the way he's covered Maui. He's done some really good work. And 
he got a hold of the video. And unlike myself, I didn't preserve the video when I first saw it, Stephen, because I thought, ah, this is they're probably not going to scrub this. And that was, I actually thought that. Well, he preserved it. And the video shows this. You don't see what's going on in Lahaina. Go to a gunnery range that was identified. It was a long Hawaiian name. I can't recall without looking at my notes. And they showed EPA workers there, masked up, hazmat suits, except for a lot of them. And they were transferring the dirt that had been put from the topsoil in Lahaina into 55-gallon drums. Now, here's the kicker. They're shipping the drums off to the mainland to undisclosed locations. In other words, let's get all the topsoil where they could have high radiation count, they could have thermite, which would be an aftermath of directed energy weapons, and any other chemical residue which would implicate wrongdoing, and let's take it to the mainland and hide it. This right. is exactly right. what they did in Paradise, California, on that fire. Uh, by the way, like too. To me that the laser would probably melt the sand like glass uh, which, you know, I, I've looked at some of these images as well that you're talking about, Dave, and and where some of these people had snuck in behind the fence line. And and literally you see, obviously it's probably aluminum that, instead of metal that would, had melted from a vehicle. Uh, and, and then no more than, you know, 20 feet over, you've got a nice, beautiful home sitting there untouched, unscorched. Uh, that tells you that, I mean, there's a difference, Dave, and maybe you could speak to this about this so people better understand that. If you're using a high intensity uh, weapon such as a laser to start a fire, you, it's not created yet the the amount of heat that, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but like, for example, when a house burns down, it's not just the house that's on fire, but even the air and everything around you, the molecules are heating up as a result of the fire burning for any extended period of time. Uh, and therefore, other objects can literally ignite because the air molecules have gotten the temperatures to such a degree that that ignites. And we see this all the time in wildfires. You know, the tree might be 20 feet yeah. away, 30 feet away from the main part of the flame, but it just all the smaller elements, the leaves and everything just bust into a torch because the, the molecules are that hot now around the tree that causes the tree to ignite. So when you're seeing these homes and cars that are totally untouched, only just a few meters away, something is wrong. And that should, that's one of the things that I think a lot of people may not understand the nature of fire in that case. Well, the one thing we know, I forget the battle in the Civil War. I want to say Shiloh, but I don't think that's it. There was a battle in the Civil War that was, it was Antietam. It was a battle in the Civil War that was fought in heavy wooded forest area. And so the massive cannon was used on both sides. And what happened, the heat was so much that even if you didn't die from the projectiles, your lungs exploded because of the heat. And and I and what I've been told, I asked um, a doctor this, who is expert in fire injuries, who wouldn't come on the show. But he said, I'll tell you the truth, but don't quote my name. He said, most of those people with the extreme heat that we know was there, he said they probably weren't burned to death. They, their lungs probably exploded before the fire reached them. Wow. The other, the other thing that happened too, I have a, I had a former high-ranking military source that got a copy of drain, Navy drone footage the morning of. And he watched the town go up. And this is a guy, multiple combat veteran, knows how weapons work. He was seeing things that greatly disturbed him. He said he didn't understand. So he brought in someone who was a fire expert. And the fire expert told him, I think I know what this is that you're seeing. But he says, we're ordered never to talk about this. And Virginia Farver just won a lawsuit against the FCC where this came up. So this has already been adjudicated at one level in Virginia. I'm going to get her back on the show to talk about Maui. But what I'm talking about smart meters, what my military source saw was like an entire block go up at the same time, not encroaching fire that would travel right. a direction. OK, now I know fire can jump, but he watched this block after block after block. Boom, boom, boom. And here's what he was told by this uh, fire expert. He said that 
if temperatures reach a certain level, smart meters, certain measure, certain types of smart meters uh, become active and become like incendiary devices. And he said, this is why you're seeing the simultaneous explosions. And he said, we're ordered by the city officials never to talk about this. Otherwise, no one would want smart meters. Now, I learned the way around this, and this happened with some of the homes that survived, is, is people said, well, it was it just because of blue roofs? And how come this house survived? It didn't have a blue roof, which supposedly makes it immune to the lasers. Um, what we know is these people, before they evacuated, were smart enough to turn off their power. And if you turn off the power, then basically the smart meter doesn't become as active. And uh, like I said, Virginia Farber won a lawsuit in this. And this is exactly what this fire expert told my military source. So they knew what was going to happen there. This was a logistical attack. And they knew that they only had to plant the seed and the smart meters would take over in a lot of these areas. Plus, these are old wood structures and they're going to burn quickly anyway. You know, Dave, speaking about the smart meters, um, back when I worked with the government, uh, I knew at that time even that in the power companies, there is a certain control room that is always on, on a lockdown. And the reason being is because in that control room, you could effectively on any house whatsoever, if you wanted to take an increase I guess it's something where they could increase the voltage right down to, to they could choose a house and cause that house to burn to the ground if they yeah. so desire. And so imagine if there is, or if there were more involved, even in that regards there, even if it's not just the fact of the smart meters, um, could it, have, could it have gotten that sinister? I mean, there's something to think about to go along with it anyway. Yeah, well, we saw too, if you've seen the aerial footage, now they this is why they banned the drone. See, Stephen, here's another thing too. A lot of us have asked this question of the experts. Have you ever seen a fire where you weren't allowed to fly a drone and take photos of it a month after the fire? Never. Never, Never seen that. It's That's still going on today. Cover up. Because the cover-up is in the midst. And let me tell you what else they're doing to cover it up. Okay, no offense to Billy Graham Ministries. They have a subset of Billy Graham Ministries, and I forget the name. But Billy Graham Ministries is the parent company. These people were allowed to come in in hazmat suits. And this was covered in the news. Okay, so this is mainstream media in Hawaii. And it showed them going through uh, the burned-out properties. And they were, shift they were sifting through the dirt and stuff. And they were looking for, quote... Uh, sacred and ancient artifacts, because remember the Maui culture, okay? And then the second thing, prized possessions. Well, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember a lady, an American living in Thailand, flew in, saw her interview, and for nine days, she wanted to go to her EMT brother's house to see where his motorcycle was at. She was trying to find clues about, could he still be alive? For nine days, FEMA, the police, everybody else says, no, you can't go in there. They won't let the owners of the land go in there and go through their own property, but they'll let Billy Graham Ministries subsidiary go in there and do exactly what they're denying. And I'll tell you why they won't. Billy Graham Ministries, they're told, don't shovel dirt into any container. Don't take it out. Why else would they be taking the topsoil out? Okay. If you have your average John Doe come in, he might start loading dirt into his shoes that can be analyzed. I guarantee you that's exactly why they're not letting those people in. They don't want them gathering the evidence. The other thing is, too, Dave, and I know this because just not how sinister they can be. Um, the government, especially in the, uh, the, whether it be CIA, NSA, et cetera, they're going to have good contacts. I mean, I know for a fact that there are certain ministries that are directly controlled by one of the other agencies. They have a working relationship with those agencies. Now, I don't know about Billy Graham, uh, so I'm not uh, saying that he is one of those, but uh, I actually did a, 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 a special on that one time about uh, different ones that were controlled by different agencies, uh, courtesy of Israel, giving me a lot of information about that. But when I say that, what happens, though, it's not going to be they might take uh, two or three of the church members 
that will be allowed to go in like that. But the rest of those people that are going to be in those hazmat suits are not going to be church members at all. And they may be in there doing some collections as well under that guise as the ministry itself when they, in fact, are not. Yeah, I question how many of those people were Billy Graham ministry uh, uh, subset as well. But here's what's interesting. You just triggered something in me. Um, I've interviewed people who illegally, against their oath and agreement, pastors who belong to the clergy response team under the control of NOVAD, which is a subset of DHS, yes. you know, Homeland Security. And I guarantee you, the people they let in there were from DHS approved organizations in the clergy response team so they could control their actions. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And there are some big names. Uh, uh, and like I said, I won't mention them on this broadcast here, but I know of one particular big name that uh, when I was I, actually after I was told this from Israel's intelligence agencies there, I contacted uh, some of the people I know in the CIA to find out if it was true. And they said, oh, yeah, they said, uh, we actually are the ones that, have, uh, you know, we, we went to him and we're the ones that made him become famous so that we could control the narratives that we wanted to control. Let, let, let me just say one thing here. Deep in the heart of Texas. Yes. <laughs> am I accurate? Because I've You're heard the accurate. same. Stephen, I've heard the same story. I'm not going to say any names. Yeah. Um, You're accurate. Because... <laughs> Oh, the name it, claim it, <laughs> grab it philosophy. Don't of you love it, right? Oh, my gosh, yes. Listen, uh, there. at one time, I interviewed a guy several years ago, probably 12 years ago, uh, Pastor Wayne Mansfield, and he was one of the original members. By, by the way, this is really interesting. He gave me documents I published. Uh, they were to be in FEMA camps with people being held. And they told them, you can't quote the Bible. God's done too much damage in history. But you can say it's God's will that you're here and you'll find a way through. And their job was to placate the people. Or if they had a hostage situation, they would be brought in. And this is not the way to do it. So that was their training uh, in the clergy response team, at least part of their training. And uh, Wayne and I, Wayne came on, did a telephone interview with me. And uh, went through all the details, gave me the documentation. I think Alex Jones actually published some of this as well, too, on InfoWars. But, yeah, you know, we look at watered-down religion. It's not just 501c3 that controls religion. You know, I can't say anything about the government because they'll come take away my tax exemption. But it's also because these people belong to the clergy response team. They're actually, right. a lot of the pastors are actually government employees. Yes, and that's sad. I mean, the church has been sold out long ago, and they have no clue that they're sold out. My uh, pastor's and, not. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what he said in church the other day. He comes out for his first comment. Something was about his background. He goes, yeah, and I identify as a man. And then he proceeds to go from there. He said the attack is on our children in the schools. and uh, And he was really specific. He didn't care about his 501c3. He just got banned from Facebook. I'm talking about Pastor Mark Driscoll of Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, love the man, stands for God, stands for truth, and does not make apologies. There's a couple of pastors who are taking stands. There are. But the problem is most of them want. They even got this one thing. I forget the name of the system, but it's actually a video system they're put into large churches that facially recognize people when they come into the service. Do you know about that? I've not, didn't know about it, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. Yeah, I wrote an article on it several years ago and I came across the document under Freedom of Information. And I forget the name of it now. If you said it, I go, yeah, that's it. But I wrote an article about it and I just thought, why do they want to identify Christians? And then it hit me. I said, holy crap. It's because one day they're going to come after the Christians. That's right. The other thing, the other thing is too, is is you know, remember I told you when I learned about the exits and the not turning the sirens on and not releasing the water, I knew they were driving up the death count. I mean, it had to be intentional at that point. And right. let me tell you, Stephen, how I, it was two days. I I just I just had really bad feelings. I couldn't figure out why would they do this? Are these just pathological murders? And then I figured it out. 
if we have six members in a family that owns a plot of land in Lahaina and four of them survive, two will rebuild. Okay, they'll demand the rights to their property. But if all six are dead, the heirs to that family probably aren't even in the islands and they'll take whatever settlement they can get and not battle the insurance companies and the developers and they'll just take it and go away. That's what I concluded about why they drove up the death rate because they didn't want very many surviving members so they didn't have people that want to rebuild in the original location. Stephen, does it bother you that Congress isn't even addressing this? It does. <clears throat> you know, and the thing is, is you, you wonder, will they ever address it? Mm. You know, and, 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 you know, I would imagine eventually somewhere they're going to let one congressman come up and start some kind of independent panel and it'll get drug out for years and, and uh, and it'll only be to say that they tried, but they're never, Dave, they're never going to do it. They're just not going to do it. Like the impeachment inquiry. Yeah. 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 Same thing. This is what's so horrible about all of this. You know, I want to ask you one other thing about, too, about this, uh, this whole thing there. You know, we know that there was Hurricane Dora that was, you know, that was approaching at the time when this all got started. Do you think that they chose the timing uh, for that system because it would help fan the flames? Or do you think it was a coincidence? Uh, what would be your thought on that? Perfect cover story. It's just like the Chinese lasers. Perfect cover story was being created for plausible deniability. I right. think there's no question. And, and here's the thing. People still, Stephen, and, and God bless Americans who aren't in tune with this. They live their lives honorably and respectfully. They pay their taxes. They raise their kids the right way, but they don't know jack squat about what you and I are talking about. And so when you tell them there's weather modification, they just like, oh man, what are you smoking? I can tell marijuana is legal in your state. And, <laughs> but we have weather war treaties filed with the UN and with right. world courts. There's international agreements between nations not to attack each other with weather weapons. And then there was... Air Force owning the weather 2025 that got leaked. I was one of the people that got leaked to, and I published it. And we have all this proof. And then you had Nick Begich's book going back to the late 1990s, Angels Don't Play This Harp. And he published all the documentation there in the first generation of weather weapons. So who are you kidding, people, that this doesn't exist? And then isn't it coincidental that right after Maui, okay, uh, DeSantis uh, state gets hit with a heavy hurricane. And he knows it. Why do you think he wouldn't meet with Biden? <laughs> he saw how Biden treated Maui. We don't need you here. What are you going to do for us? Send us $700? See, that's the thing that really pisses me off, Steve. Okay. Biden, first of all, and I don't think he knew. Uh, one of the things I did in my younger days, I was trained about body language. I taught it when I taught undergrad sociology. And, and so I'm pretty good at reading it. And I was reading Joe Biden when he was asked the question, Mr. Uh, it was from Bloomberg reporter. That's the thing that was shocking. Uh, he wasn't avoiding a right wing reporter, like someone from Fox. And they said, Mr. Biden, Mr. President, what do you think about the rising death toll in Maui? And he got this. And it was like, he didn't know. His first reaction told me, this was the first he heard about it. It was surprise, raised his eyebrows, kind of leaned back, and he was shocked. Then he goes, no, no comment. And he got this, he got, he got just vilified for saying no comment, like he didn't give a crap. He said no comment because no, he, he was he so just shocked. Didn't know. That's he didn't know why. what the hell to say. They made this operational yeah. decision without him. And Stephen, it's my belief this is a private operation. This, I mean, they they probably used. I'm not saying Raytheon, but someone like a Raytheon or a Martin Mer Martin Lockheed, they would have used technology developed by them, DARPA. Um, right. And I'm not saying those organizations were involved because I have no proof of that. But what I can say is I'm pretty sure this was a private off the books operation. And, and Biden never knew. And I guarantee you Obama knew. I guarantee you Susan Rice knew. I guarantee you that some key people in the Biden administration knew. OK, probably General Milley knew, but I doubt seriously that he knew because it was like, what do you think? And he does this. Uh, no comment. He's thinking, 
I need to get on the phone and find out what the hell is going on. I guarantee that's what he was thinking. Yeah. And, and so the, so the thing is, is with it though, with the plans of this and to making it a smart city, no doubt then Maui is not going to play as big of a pivotal role, maybe in the world network of smart cities. Uh, but undoubtedly they're going to, they're going to create it anyway. So the, it seems like me, to me, more of your private investors like BlackRock, et cetera, got involved in being willing to take it all down and then to buy it up later uh, and to create this smart city. So, you yeah. know, I would assume it's all part of the agenda 2030 program. It is. They're planning. It is. Out anyway, there's no question. When you look at what the governor was heavily into leading up to that, you look at the documents associated with this. It's all agenda 2030. But there's also the Oprah factor. Now, listen, you're not going to hear me say she's got the kids in her tunnels under her house. And I'm not saying that stuff. I don't even know if the woman has tunnels. I do know this. She had fire protection the day before. And she has security to keep the refugees from coming on her land. And I kind of don't blame her because she's public enemy number one in the islands right now, her and the rock. But let me tell you what I did see, Stephen, that greatly bothered me. When her and rock came out with their video to collect money, okay, they almost acted like they were collecting money for a celebration. They're de I mean, this was a horrible tragedy. And they had a jovial demeanor. And I first saw that, I go, man. Oprah, aren't you smarter than this to come on here and you're upbeat and cheerful? Send us the money. They need the money now. <laughs> oh, we're doing so. And I'm just thinking, you are out of your mind to do this. That was my first reaction. And then you know what? You didn't have to read body language to see this. The public saw through it. It's so bad that the rest of the mainstream media has run from Maui because of people like me that are on to what happened. So they're running from it and doing damage control by not talking about it, except with one person. They had Oprah on the morning shows. W Oprah, why would they do this to you? You were doing nothing but trying to help the people. So they're trying to rehabilitate her image. But that's the only mainstream media involvement. And I got to tell you, I don't know what or if or Oprah had any involvement in it, but her reaction is totally inappropriate. Yes. Totally. Because so many lives are going to, you know, have been destroyed as a result of this. And then, of course, the question still comes down as to what really happened to these children. Did they die? Were they taken to a secret dis uh, uh, undisclosed location? Uh, have they taken them off as part of their smuggling operation of children? And they just figure, OK, well, we've got two birds with stone, uh, you know, with, with one stone there. You know, what? how is that going to play out still yet? Uh, OK, Here, here's that? what you find. Here's what you find if you go to the Department of Hawaii Education. Lahaina School District enrollment, 3,001 students, 400 enrolled in other districts, 200 doing virtual learning. Where are the other 2,400 kids? Now, right. we don't hear a word from the principal, the principals of these schools. We don't hear a word from the superintendent or school board members of these schools. They have totally been silenced. Listen, I've been at schools where there's been a tragedy. I was at a high school one time early in my career, and three kills were uh, kids were killed in a recreation school sponsored ski trip, and their bus went off a cliff, and three of them died. It was a big deal, and our administration was in the media. Okay. You have, I don't even know who these people are, what they look like, because they're not allowed to go out. This is part of the cover up. And see, going back to what I said originally about releasing the kids, the only way a superintendent or a principal would ever release a kid is if a higher authority took responsibility. That'd be the only way they do it, Stephen. Right. And they're not allowed to talk. And I guarantee you, they're under threat not to talk. Because by this point, don't you think they'd hold a vigil? It wouldn't that be the typical response here? Right, right. If there were dead children involved. But then the question comes down, though, Dave, is uh, is it a good group that has the children or is it a sinister group? And, and, and then, of course, then where are the parents? I've got information. Well, let me tell you one thing that came up. Um, I don't know if I could prove this in a court of law, except I could find collaborating witnesses. 
um, there was a pastor in Lanai, and I saw the end of his sermon. And he said, very disturbingly, 183 people have washed up on our shores. Now, if these people drowned in the ocean getting away from the fire, the current could have taken them to Lanai. I've verified that. But there are other stories where some of the locals are saying these people had bullet wounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and let me tell you what I'm really, I would investigate. This is what I would investigate if I had control, not that I would find what I suspect. So I want to be careful on how I say this. Uh, the authorities claim that at the time of the fire, they had nothing in the air over Lahaina. That's a lie. They had, I've seen a video of a cargo helicopter that I've learned could hold 52 people and another helicopter of smaller. Um, if those people were shot when they were in the water and then their bodies drifted across to Lanai, um, that might have been how they did it. Um, would there have been too much smoke to do it? So that's a question I asked myself. I don't know. But they lied about no aircraft over Lahaina at the time. That's an absolute lie. I've seen proof that contradicts that you see the smoke you see the fire and right. through the smoke you see the helicopters okay so why would they lie about that what are they covering up with that lie um see like i said this whole thing just stinks to high heaven here's another problem i have too we sent in the in the tsunami of 2004 in malaysia we sent military people who agreed to leave their guns on their ships uh because it would have violated muslim law and they went ashore carrying boxes of food and medical supplies for the people. Okay, so we did that for the people in Malaysia. Where the hell was the military for Lanai? Why were private, con in fact, I got another videotape of Pastor Lafrog, he's pretty famous, he's, in Maynard, he's on Oahu. And he was telling people, yes, we're gonna gather supplies and get it to the people, but do not put what we're doing on social media because we will be intercepted. In other words, FEMA and the Red Cross are going to interdict our supplies. They're going to throw it in these landfills. That's effectively oh, what he's saying. Yeah. And they were figuring out a way to get around the blockades to get the supplies to the people. Uh, it, it, see, I, I, I look at this, Stephen, and I'm just saying every aspect of this seemed to be designed to kill the people. For example, yes. here's another thing. They're not putting water in. OK, to the Lanai, north of the Lanai area towards Wall Wallaloo. Uh, they're not putting uh, water in there. The water is contaminated and not even safe to bathe in. And these people here five weeks later still haven't received any relief. So the abuse of these people is still ongoing. I maintain this is a mass murder site. I think there's enough evidence from the government they knew this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. We've seen the proof of the lasers on the ground with like AirQuest videos. They knew this was going to happen. They want to maximize the death count. I think the case is solid for that. And now they're still trying to make these people suffer and perhaps die. Well, you know, as I was sharing with you before we came on on here, Dave, too, is that uh, the FEMA friend that I have, who is an engineer in FEMA, had uh, uh, I actually read to you some of the comments there, and um, did, and I'll just read some of these here. FEMA is no longer supplying food and water. The food and water that is being distributed is through private churches organizations. They were told to stop allocating resources there, meaning Lahaima. Uh, no additional information provided other than to stand down. It was exactly the same scenario with the hurricane uh, center in Florida. They appear at the first week and pulled resources the second week. Uh, right now, people are hurting for water and shelter, and they have no intentions of supporting them. Quote, unquote. Well, here's the other thing that's happened, too. I couldn't tell you the substance because I don't have it in front of me. I didn't commit it to memory, and I'm not a chemist. But they had options of how they treated the ground. But they treated the ground with chemicals that will destroy everything. So that tells me, again, they're still trying to erase evidence. But they're making the land uninhabitable for a while, too. In other words, the EPA has issued a two-year moratorium on rebuilding anything. Well, what person from uh, Lahaina can afford to hang out at Hawaii rates for two years? Right. 
while they get a chance to get back on their land and then a chance to rebuild with their $700. You know, it's interesting too. You had the FEMA people stay in luxury hotels for over $1,000 a night, which is $300 more than the average family got in Lahaina. How disgusting is that? It's, it's very disgusting. And, uh, and, and But it just goes to show this whole world that we're living in right now uh, is definitely headed for the agenda 2030. Uh, and they don't care who they run over, who has to suffer, who they have to destroy in their path or in their wake along the way, uh, Dave. I mean, I, I would really be even curious to even go back to the Neom city and, and, and see what they did in Saudi Arabia to build this. And this is supposed to be uh, the world's first smart city uh, where Egypt and Israel are involved even into it. So well, it's everywhere. Arizona. Yeah. Stephen, let me tell you about Arizona. We have, um, and I've been told this by insiders who know knows what's coming. We have something called Prop 400, which is a, a bill that the voters will vote on in the 2024 election, presuming we have it. And um, it's, it's couched as a highway bill. And um, it's interesting that the one highway, the main highway, and it's only 40% of the funds will go to highway. So what's the 60% for? I'll get to that in a second. But as an aside, it's interesting. Bill Gates plans to build a smart city west of Phoenix on the outskirts of Buckeye, which is a far western suburb towards California. And the highway emanates out of the Bill Gates planned area into the downtown area. How convenient for Bill. Just lucky he got that in. OK, now the other thing they've done is there's funding for arterial streets. Now, I learned this on my property rights days. Uh, it's one thing to acquire land for a thoroughfare through eminent domain. Um, so like if you're building Highway 51, which they did through North Phoenix into downtown area uh, 20, 25 years ago, um, it's one thing you got to pay the homeowners and rip their homes out, build the highway. But when you do arterial funding, that means the surrounding surface streets can be rezoned and you make those properties worth much less now your cost of eminent domain to those people goes way down. So rather than paying maybe wow. $300,000 for a house, you're paying 125,000. And they're doing that in this bill. See, the average person won't know that because they didn't have eight years like I did fighting these property rights issues. Right. But there's more. There's more. I've been told, and, and I'm not gonna get specific because I don't wanna burn a source. And the source has been a friend to me for years. But there's a second source that's confirmed this. They're going to put midnight legislation in and hope people don't read it. And the midnight legislation is to make Arizona completely smart city compliant through the whole state, forcing mm -hmm. farms to stop, moving people out of rural areas into densely packed populated areas called smart cities. And they'll have the 15 minute city concept on top of it. Phoenix has adopted the 15-minute uh, city model. Scottsdale's adopted part of it. And you go down to Tucson, they've done the whole enchilada. And here's what's interesting. They're hiding all this. If you go to the Tucson City website and you put in smart city or 15-minute city, you can't find it. But if you go to Google and put it in, it'll take you to the city uh, website where you can find it. So clearly, they have block search engine from direct search on their site, but they can't block Google. So Google has it. You can see it if you go through Google. They're trying to block it. And we got videotape of the meetings. We got city meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. And they had some uh, uh, reporters there. And they asked questions like this. How long will it take? And here's what uh, uh, this guy named Ortega, the city manager, said. Oh, we estimate about one to 10 years. Well, what that tells me is this guy's taking orders from somewhere else. He ain't in charge of this project. If you give an answer like this project's going to take one to 10 years, I can understand eight to 10 years, but one to 10 years, this guy's taking orders from right. somebody else. Because he and doesn't so, know what he's talking about. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. Hmm. So um, anyway. Okay. 
It has been a pleasure to have you on today. And uh, do you have two things? One, if you can uh, share with people, I mean, I know it's a common sense show, but I know you have a you have a podcast. If you can share with people, and we'll include that in the link in the description below for people to be able to follow the work you do uh, and any closing comments that you would like to make. Okay. I am at thecommonsenseshow.com. That's our website, and that's kind of our flag station, and I publish a fair amount of our YouTube videos there. If you want to go to YouTube, you can find me under the same name, The Common Sense Show. Uh, since Maui, by the way, we've had over a million people have come to our site. So people wow. are showing interest. Uh, we also have a podcast that's fairly high rated. It's I'm, I'm really uh, honored by that. And we publish that in some of our top YouTube postings at the bottom of our webpage. So you can see what it is. And if it's 50 minutes long, then that's our uh, podcast. And that's also our radio network release. We're on Global Star, Red State Talk Radio, and I got a show on Brighton. So those three networks, uh, but it's identical to our podcast. We also have a TV show called The Common Sense Show TV, and you can go there and sign up for it. And we do in-depth documentaries there. And I've made it a point to have a panel of experts come in one at a time. Some of them have regime change experience because that's what's happening to us here We've been conquered by communists doing a regime change on multiple levels. And we cover that so we can have people see, although this has never happened in America before, it's happened in the world. So what can we learn from it? What can we expect? And here are some ways to navigate so you have a softer landing. And so we have a TV show dedicated to, to action. So that's, that's our stuff. And my final thoughts are this. Um, we can't beat their Agenda 2030 nationally. I don't think, but I think we can beat them in Maui. And I've said Maui is the hill to die on because they're so they're so exposed. Uh, they're so criminally complicit and it's easy to show that I think we could win there. And if we win in Maui, we could take that model and mobilize the country and take it forward. So this is why I'm saying Maui is the hill to die on. It absolutely is. Uh, yeah. and, I, and, and, and I'm asking people to stay in tune. I promised the people of Maui that I've talked to, I will stay active for a while longer. And as a consequence, um, staying active here means that just being aware and there's going to come a time we're going to need to raise money for legal defense funds and so forth. And it's going to be we the people because the mainstream media is done with Maui. They want you to forget about it because they think it's a fait accompli. And if they're quiet, you'll forget about it and have ADHD and move on to the next topic. We need to keep a foot in Maui and an eye on Maui. Yes. So when it's time to mobilize, we can bring the country together and win that battle. I agree, Dave, 100%. And that's, I, I think that you're, you're right. And because it, it is seems to be a smaller operation, not as big, many of the larger names were involved in it, it may be the battle that we could actually win. So the more exposure we do, the better it will be. So thank you, Dave, for coming on. Steve, my pleasure. Israeli News Live. God bless you. And thank you guys for listening and being with us today.